eagles in behind us here, so I'm hoping that they're going to show up here in the next little bit. Uh, I'm up at Secret Cove and Half Moon Bay for the last two months, and uh, I'm working up here, but I'm also tracking and uh, mapping Half Moon Bay Creek, which is a small salmon creek um, for the Pacific Salmon Foundation, actually, and they've given us some really cool little cameras, and we're actually mapping. I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, uh, we're actually in the water, very carefully in the water, only in certain spots, and uh, mapping these small little creeks all across British Columbia with the Pacific Salmon Foundation. But uh, it's been beautiful up here, but uh, we're surrounded by eagles. So I'll, I'll turn that up. We do see a couple of eagles in behind us or over top of us. So hopefully we'll get some, uh, you can all see it. Um, I would also like to thank, yeah, um, everybody for all the good work you've been doing with the Still Moon Art Society for so many years. The environmental stewardship with groups like yours is critical for obviously, you know, the sacred salmon. And uh, last couple of years, I've been starting to do a lot of a lot of kind of work uh, with the southern resident orcas and the connections between uh, uh, hatchery fish and uh, the, the wild salmon, of course. I'll get into that a little bit later, but uh, it's a beautiful place to work up here. Um, sometimes I have a rough time working actually with a view like this, but um, but also would really like to thank, yeah, for working on the lands of Tisleyewit II, Squamish, Musqueam, uh, all up and down the river, you know, Simiamu and White Rock, um, uh, Musqueam, of course, down the end of the, the river, uh, all the way up to Kwantlen and uh, KK8, uh, Katsi Nation. Uh, they're all connected and they're all connected from the Fraser River, the Salish Sea, obviously, um, you know, in the Brunette watershed. Um, I'll first tell you how I got into stream keeping. Uh, it was about 25 years ago. And I was monitoring the eagles up in Burnaby Mountain during the winter. And uh, all the little salmon creeks up there, most of them back then, I didn't really know a bunch of the smaller names of them, but we were having some severe development issues. And uh, sediment problems, oil spills, a lot of diesel spills, which is the biggest problem in the lower mainland. Um, so much so that I've actually uh, specialized in spills and chemical spills and diesel spills. I go to most of the spills on the coast now. Um, every, everything from the bunker spill, the MV Marathasa, back a few years ago, we had uh, a lot of the spills you never hear about. And uh, they're kind of wiped away from the media or they, you know, they said they're cleaned up. Most of them never really get cleaned up. But uh, so a lot of my work is there and has been. Uh, I'd rather do some other work and shoot wildlife like I do, but uh, it does keep me pretty busy, but it also teaches me a lot and uh, started to work with the Coast Guard the last couple of years, which has really helped out. Um, they've been actually really good with me, the Canadian Coast Guard, um, sending pictures from the Aurora Plains and uh, you know all the spills. And a lot of these diesel spills in and around uh, the communities, the coastal communities of Vancouver, um, they are actually quite dangerous and uh, they're very toxic. Uh, marine diesel is much more toxic than res uh, regular diesel. And uh, a lot of the media, a lot of the agencies will tell people that it actually disappears in a couple hours, which you can't really see it, but it'll hang around for weeks and months on end. And uh, the Canadian Coast Guard has these tracker planes, these Auroras and a couple of new ones now, I'm not sure what they're called. And they spent uh, tens of millions of dollars on oil tracking uh, cameras. But for some reason, sometimes they can never find these, but. Me and a couple of friends can always find them within a half an hour or hour, these diesel spills, but they are very dangerous. We had a tug sink about a year and a half ago in the Fraser River, and uh, it created quite a bit of damage. Uh, there was 300 herons that were affected by that diesel spill with that tug a couple, about a year and a half ago on the north arm of the Fraser. So we, we have our work cut out for us, but uh, that's when I started up in Burnaby Mountain about 25 years ago was monitoring the eagles. I've been doing that for uh, obviously quite a long time and that got me involved in uh, stream keeping and uh, I kind of started out with Deer Lake Brook actually which the city of Burnaby looks after and it was nice and it was nice and close and uh, um, I could walk down there and uh, keep an eye on the creek all the time. I always tell anybody who gets involved in stream keeping to get into your local creek. You're much more apt to help out. Uh, don't get one, you know, all the way across town unless you have a special connection to it. But uh, if you're helping out with any environmental groups, uh, try to stick to the ones that are close to home, your local salmon creeks or whatever it may be. 
and uh, all the environmental groups across British Columbia can sure use a hand. And if anybody needs uh, any contacts or any environmental groups or stream keeping groups, uh, send me a message later and I'll, con I'll, I'll put you in contact with almost anybody in British Columbia. We've got some amazing groups all around British Columbia. And Burnaby, where I do most of my work, um, we've got uh, Eagle Creek Stream Keepers, the Stony Creek Environment Committee, um, Still Moon with the Renfrew Creek crew. Uh, we've got Burn Creek. Um, I've forgotten a couple already, but uh, yeah, it's really good. We've got the BCIT students and Mark Angelo doing some absolutely amazing work. Mark's a good friend of mine and a mentor of mine. He's taught me a lot over the last 10 or so years. Uh, he's a real inspiration and uh, as many of you know he started World Rivers Day and uh, we get to celebrate it every year uh, down at the Burnaby Village Museum and uh, it's it's really something special it's celebrated right around the world World Rivers Day and uh, it's a it's been kind of a keystone a day for people around the world and uh, the amount of press that that gets uh, World Rivers Day actually really helps us out a lot to protect the sacred salmon um, being uh, indigenous and uh, ancestry myself, um, we grew up in and around, but I grew up in Burnaby, but we grew up always with salmon. We always had salmon. We always had uncles fishing, my, you know, grandpas, everybody, my cousins still fish. And they're the two of my cousin and my uncle are two of the best fishermen that I know. And, but they kind of got me into it, uh, my uncle Al, many years ago, and just protecting the waters, protecting these creeks, protecting the marinas that I'm close to one right now here. And, uh, but I, I didn't know it till a couple of years ago, how instrumental my fishing trips over with my uncle way back up here, back in the mid seventies and late seventies and early eighties, he'd take us fishing up here. He'd teach us about the water, how to proper responsibility with the boats. Um, everything was quite, it was quite, uh, quite a learning lesson for me and my brothers. But uh, yeah, so it's been a lot of fun. I really help out now with Silver Creek. I've been looking after for many, many years on Burnaby Mountain. Um, it's a government listed Silver Creek. I call it the Forgotten Creek in Burnaby, Salmon Creek in Burnaby. It's a tiny little creek, starts up at SFU. Uh, Stony Creek is a very, it's right beside it. Uh, Stony Creek is a very healthy per se creek. Uh, but, and we've got Eagle Creek on the other side. Uh, it's much healthier but it's a critically endangered creek and it's had a lot of challenges for the last 10 years. I've almost turned into more of an advocate now. I, I, I end up putting out fires in the creeks more than anything. And uh, first for many years, I did it by myself and with just one or two friends, a good group and a family, Ed Von Yu has looked after the creek, his family since 2002 and I've done an amazing job, uh, his two boys. And then they, he took a break for a bit. And now he's back, which is really good. And that, uh, that has really helped out. But we have had a lot of challenges with the creeks in Burnaby. Uh, Burn Creek in South Burnaby, uh, Paul Sipawink and uh, uh, the amazing crew over there. They got some really, uh, always had these uh, development issues, but we're pretty well everywhere you go, we've got these serious development issues. Uh, Burnaby is just booming. It's still even, you know, the last couple of years, uh, it's just the development is it's it's just off the charts. We've got a really good crew in Burnaby environmental crew, but they are they're literally run off their feet, and uh, that's where we come in as stream keepers and stewards. Uh, we help them out quite a bit, and uh, we work together very closely, very closely actually. And the city of Burnaby has been amazing to me and all the other stream keeping groups, and uh, and we sure need their help. That's for sure. But it also goes right up to the provincial government. Anybody who knows the challenge has been around for a year or two uh, as a stream keeper knows that we have some serious challenges. And uh, a lot of that is habitat loss. A lot of that is sediment problems, pollution problems. Um, education seems to be the biggest key. Uh, just a lot of people don't realize these, there are salmon creeks in, uh, in around Burnaby, Vancouver. And, uh, but education is a huge amount. I uh, love taking uh, young children out. Uh, we drop fish into the creek. Uh, most of the fish come from Kanaka Creek out in Maple Ridge. And uh, that's something that's a very special that a lot of these young children, when we take the school kids out, that actually seems to stick with them, and uh, which is really cool. And they, a lot of the salmon programs in the local elementary schools are, 
are key. I, 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 I've seen it for many years. Quite often we'll get the students come back, uh, you know, five, 10 years later and help us out, 15, 20 years later after high school, they'll come back and help us out. So it's really cool, it's really cool. But uh, yeah, we have a very, um, I lived on Burnaby Mountain for many years. And uh, I literally, Silver Creek is 200 meters away from me on either side. It's got four tributaries. Uh, we have the Trans Mountain Tank Farm, Trans Mountain Corporation Tank Farm. It's been there since 1953. Uh, Eagle Creek and Silver Creek run right through the tank farm. Tank farm, a lot of people don't realize it's a massive, it's a massive tank farm. Uh, they're doing a big expansion now. And we've had some issues up there. We've had some serious issues. Um, but we've been working uh, alongside uh, many of the other stream keeping groups. Trans Mountain's been uh, doing their best, but they've had some issues. Um, but they've been getting a little bit better lately, which is good. We also had, uh, last two and a half years, Fortis did uh, the largest uh, pipeline um, in their history in the last 30 years. And right through the neighborhood, it actually went from East Vancouver all the way to Coquitlam. And they were an amazing group to work with. Fortis was, was unbelievable. Uh, we started about two years before they dropped the shovels in the ground. And uh, they actually listened to the stream keepers. We went to many meetings. We did tours with uh, the Fortis crew. Uh, I just, they are absolutely one of the best companies, large companies I've ever worked with. And uh, we, I got to take young students, young keen students from the locals on these tours. And uh, these tours are with, they're, they're pretty high up uh, uh, senior management and uh, um, the environmental monitors and uh, not just the environmental monitors, but we have engineers on these tours. So I like to teach the young kids and we teach them immediately right there. And Fortis has been so good uh, over that three and a half year period. Um, they actually donated uh, cedar to, a lot, uh, to myself, uh, two cedar uh, trees that they had to cut down. I stripped them uh, a couple of years ago and we shared them with family and my niece and Emily Carr University. Um, but yeah, an amazing group to work with, amazing large, you know, ministry, really a corporation. But uh, yeah, and we, most of the time we, we get that. We almost get a lot, a lot of the large corporations, but it isn't perfect. Uh, about five, six years ago, we had a very serious coal spill in Silver Creek, uh, right across from Costco and Burnaby down near Winston Government Street. And uh, I was there the next morning. It was actually caused, well, it wasn't caused by a beaver, uh, but CN had an accident on CP's tracks and uh, um, a beaver had, uh, the water was quite high that year in Silver Creek or that weekend and very high. And a beaver had dug out underneath the train tracks and uh, it created quite a mess. It was a good thing there was no deaths from many of the train workers. Um, but three of the metallurgical coal, the coal comes from uh, a Sparwood area near Cranbrook. And it's kind of like fine dust. And uh, they make, um, it's sent off to Asia, shipped from North Vancouver from there. But it literally destroyed everything in Silver Creek for about 400 meters. All the aquatic organisms, uh, all the fish, um, we don't even know the loss was at that time. There was no way to quantify and measure and uh, the water had washed everything out. What happened with the metallurgical coal was uh, took us a couple of weeks to find out. I was working with Larry Pinn, who's a good friend of mine from the Vancouver Sun, who I've been doing work with since 2008 as a freelance photographer. And uh, I had to do my homework. You always have to do your homework. But what happened when these coal trains come from Sparwood uh, it's very fine, fine dust up to chunks about the size of a toonie or loony at the most. But for the most part, it's almost like a talcum powder flour and a rice flour kind of thing. And as soon as that hit the water, um, it turned into a, a just a gloppy mess. And uh, the, the company has to spray a topping agent on top of these open coal cars and... Uh, Eventually, in about 10 years, they'll all be closed cars. Uh, they're mandated by law now, but it's going to take about 10 years. Uh, but there's a topping agent that the trains go through. They spray this topping agent. It's a chemical mixture. Uh, it's supposedly not that bad for uh, um, fish, and it used to be horrible. 
But what happens when that topping mixture and that fine dust hits fresh water or seawater, it really turns into an oily globby mess and it killed everything immediately. All the fish, all the aquatic organisms. We usually have about 25 to 30 uh, aquatic organisms, key aquatic organisms, many more in a typical little creek in around the lower mainland. And it wiped it out for 400 meters, went right into the Brunette River, wiped out a bunch of fish there. Uh, the next day I walked down the Brunette River um, all the way six and a half kilometers uh, down to the Fraser River and it was a complete disaster for two or three days after. Uh, it was actually for two or three uh, weeks after. It was really bad but CP and CN had a good insurance uh, but we had to hold their feet to the fire with the Vancouver Sun and the Burnaby Now. Uh, I, I'm not sure how many articles I did but we did a lot. Uh, they basically had to dig out the creek. It took it took millions of dollars. I'm so happy that they did do it. And uh, they were pretty good to work with. Um, uh, it was, uh, it could have been much, much worse if it was at a different time of year. Uh, we have a salmon pond down below there, below the RV, um, Caribou RV Park. And it completely filled up with this metallurgical coal. Uh, got pictures of me and Larry Pin in there in the Vancouver Sun. and you know, page two or three or whatever it was. And I tell you, I would not want to go on that stuff again. We had our, our boots on. Uh, it was very dramatic pictures, but unfortunately for the three months after, we lost uh, ducks in there. The ducks would go in there. Um, and we still, they had to literally hand shovel this stuff out of the salmon pond that was about, you know, 30 meters by about 10 meters. And uh, it's, uh, they tried to rebuild it, but it, it's, it'll never be the same, unfortunately. We're still finding five years later, uh, as the creek uh, you know, expands and goes out, we're still finding large coal seams. And uh, the group, uh, CN comes back and CP, they do come back, the group, the environmental groups, and come clean it up here and there. But those are just some of the challenges that we see in these local creeks. I always tell stream keepers, I help a lot of the stream keepers with the media because it used to be a last resort for me, not just because I work with the media, but to get anything done, uh, a lot of the stream keepers, environmental groups know any serious problems, you really got to bang on some doors. And uh, I was told by a, a biologist, a fish biologist, a well-known fish biologist uh, many years ago, seven, eight years ago, that uh, uh, they just go to the media first now to get anything done to, to save the salmon or the cutthroat trout or any of the wildlife. It used to be a last resort. It still is for me. Um, you know, I've, I've uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I've built a lot of uh, good friendships and uh, over the years with even the provincial government, uh, the federal government. It's not perfect by any means, but uh, sometimes we have to we have to go to the media and we have to we have to shake a stick once in a while. And uh, actually, more than once in a while, quite often, and, uh, and that's kind of uh, most people never want to do that. And uh, but that's where I do a lot of a lot of help out there with the other stream keeping groups and stuff like that. Especially when we lose fish or we have a big development issue uh, that is causing the habitat loss, or they're in the riparian zone, or you know, there's all sorts of things going on all up and down the coast. But uh, but it's been very rewarding. It's been immensely rewarding for me. I've met some amazing people, stream keeping. Um, uh, it all encompasses my work with, you know, with the local First Nations, Indigenous uh, First Nations. I do a lot of work all up and down the river. Uh, I do tours, which is really cool. Um, you know, wildlife tours, First Nations plant tours, and, uh, but mainly the stream keeping and the photography is what keeps me busy now. And, uh, and I absolutely love doing it. It's been a lot of fun. I always tell everybody, uh, we want kids uh, to get engaged, get away from their computers. Here we are in times of COVID, a um, little strange times for sure. But uh, if you ever want the young kids to get away, get them in a creek, get them dropping fish in a creek when they're this big, and uh, uh, pull on invasive species, uh, doing bug counts. The kids seem to love the bug counts. Uh, I, I don't like the bug count so much, but uh, I've done a lot of it and uh, the old eyes aren't as good anymore, but, uh, but it's a very rewarding. The kids get exercise and uh, they get hours for, you know, any of their volunteer groups. And, uh, but yeah, it's been a lot of fun. The photography has really helped me too. Um, 
I, now I go to, if there's a big development on one of the creeks or near the creeks, uh, I'm usually told by the city uh, what's happening and then uh, I'll go introduce myself. I, I don't give my stream keeping card. I give my environmental photography card. And uh, I just tell them, you know, it's a beautiful creek, we go for a little tour. Um, Squamish Nation, where my grandma was from, late grandma Ethel Dolly Johnson, uh, they, they have a really cool program. Uh, it's called the Witness Program. And uh, boots down. And my mom was involved for 10 years and up in the Sims Valley, upper uh, Squamish, uh, Squamish River Valley, and up in the Sims River Valley. Uh, it was almost clear cut. It was like literally days away from being clear cut, a massive, massive area. The Squamish Nation elders got together, got uh, all the chiefs involved, and they started doing, it's called the Witness Program. My mom was uh, doing medicine wheel and doing healing up there. And they'd go up and bring anybody and everybody in the media who they did it for 10 years. It took 10 years to save that, uh, basically those two valleys. Uh, there's some of the last areas in the Sims area alley that's, that's got uh, a yellow cedar, a large amount of yellow cedar. And literally it was a, a few days from being uh, all mowed down, you know, over a large, long period of time. But uh, yeah, so my mom told me already quite a few years ago, my mom's 85 years old. She's an amazing lady, amazing elder. And uh, she told me, you got to invite these people for tours. You've got to show them what you see every day. And uh, so I started inviting everybody. Um, some of them don't come, some of the, you know, but uh, I've been lucky enough in the province, a lot of the people from the uh, Ministry of Environment have come out in the tours, um, which is really cool. Flynn Row with the Forest Natural Resources uh, have come out in the tours. And uh, a lot of them have never been in Salmon Creeks before. And the tiny little ones in Burnaby, I always take them to the little ones. They all know about the big ones, but uh, you get them during the returns. Like I take them to anywhere from Burn Creek, to Silver Creek, you know, Stony Creek's an amazing place to see. And, and uh, Steel Creek, uh, which uh, Still Moon Art knows a lot about the salmon in there. Uh, we've had a couple very rough years. Um, I'm down in the Brunette watershed pretty well every day during the returns. Uh, my good friend Glenn is with me. He's uh, in here tonight and uh, online here. We are always walking around that area. And it doesn't matter if it's down Burnaby Lake, down uh, all the way down to uh, Deer Lake, up near Renfrew Creek, all the way along and uh, down the watershed. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, a lot of the people don't know how many creeks there has and is there. Uh, we lost a couple little creeks um, to development lately some small little ones, but we've got some really cool little creeks that got a lot of potential in Burnaby, in the Burnaby Lake watershed specifically. Uh, Bona Vista Creek, I've started to see a bunch of fish in there the last four or five years. Uh, Cedar Creek I was looking really good about five or six years ago, but unfortunately it had a, a natural landslide uh, up in the, uh, the George Derby lands that really wiped out. It was a clay sand thing that uh, is just not so good, but uh, but uh, we are, now it's really cool to see, and I've been asked to help out with a lot of the creeks and restoring these creeks back uh, back to normal. Some of them, they, you know, we have to daylight quite a few of them. A lot of our friends, uh, Celia Brower, a good friend of mine, she's been involved in that for years in Vancouver. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things I really enjoy doing now is helping out and just adding my little bit of experience when we daylight a creek. Uh, when we do uh, riparian zones and we do plans for creeks uh, that we can drop fish in again. Um, and that gets back to lately there's been a lot of controversy uh, and not so much controversy about hatchery fish and the wild fish and that the hatchery fish they find out lately last couple of years are really out competing the wild fish in many areas for the foods and the phytoplanktons and the Plankton, so we're going to see a lot more with that. I've been trying to get on that boat that goes up to, uh, I'll get on it sooner or later, <laughs> uh, that boat that goes up to Alaska every year with uh, five or six nations, uh, countries from around the world doing that amazing work. Um, and they go all the way up to Alaska and uh, they are starting to do some very serious DNA testing on the chum, all the, all the 
multiple species, five main species, salmon uh, up the coast, but they're finding out exactly where they're going in Alaska and like two thirds of the way to Japan. Uh, specifically, uh, there's a lot more information on the chum salmon. Um, so the biologists found out a couple of years ago that there's, that's what they're starting to see, that we've become so successful in certain areas with the hatchery fish, but these hatchery fish are actually out competing the wild fish. I tell you, when I read that, and that hit me like, oof. oof. Sorry. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah, all those years. All of us are doing that amazing work. To have that and to find out um, that it it could be detrimental was just brutal. It, it hit me hard. Still is. Um, but um, yeah, they're finding out a lot more about that. And I, um, I'm going to be on top of that one, that's for sure. Very lucky that we get, we got some community advisors um, uh, Scott is our new guy in the, with the DFO. Uh, we have Maurice and Maurice, uh, amazing community advisors. And then uh, we can get all sorts of good information from DFO. We don't get everything. A lot of our good friends are on uh, uh, CHAB. Uh, so they go meet up quite a few times a year throughout British Columbia. All the stream keeping groups uh, can tell DFO their problems. And um, and then we work on that together. Those groups work on that together. But uh, yeah, so one of the big things, I just want to show you here that I've been involved in. A lot of people don't realize that chum salmon, that are most of the creeks that we put in, um, that the southern resident orcas uh, in their winter diet are up to 10 to 20% of their winter diet. I've been lucky we got to see a bunch of orcas about three weeks ago here actually just down the road i'm not sure if you can see here but i'm in secret cove at my amazing girlfriend's beautiful place um and we were watching for whales every day uh last year i got to see a lot of whales i got to uh, i spent 70 days in the water last year just out here and in half moon bay um maybe able to see the eagle right there that's one of Lori's, uh, somebody carved that for her, and there's another one over here. But it's an amazing place for me to actually do my work. And uh, like I said, with Half Moon Bay Creek, um, which is really cool, I've started to meet all the um, really good stream keepers up here on the Sunshine Coast, uh, Seashell Nation, uh, um, Chapman Creek uh, crew, and uh, we've got a new stream keeping group uh, down about 30 kilometers away, which is really neat. And everybody helps each other, which is really cool. But uh, back to the orcas, um, I've been lucky, like I said, to spend a lot of time on stand-up paddleboard and the, um, on the kayaks in the last two and a half years with my work up here. And it's been absolutely, I go out all, all the time. I go out right 12 months of the year. Um, I swim 12 months of the year up here. Uh, it's ceremony, it's very healing for me. But to see the whales has been just absolutely amazing. As a surfer, and uh, for many, many years, I've got to see a lot of whales around the world. I've been very, very lucky to see a lot of whales um, fishing off a big bank and you know, off Ukulet, Hawaii, Mexico. Um, I, wow, I, all sorts of different places. Uh, but to see them right here is absolutely amazing. But uh, to see them in Bra uh, in Brard Inlet is absolutely blown me away the last five years. I've seen dolls, uh, we spend a lot of time down at Barnett Beach, we hike up and down Barnett Beach, Admiralty Point, uh, um, uh, way, way, uh, Kate's Park and uh, uh, Belcara area, and we're out in the water quite a bit or just hiking around the area. And about five years ago, I was telling my Thursday night hiking group um, that I said, it's my dream that we can see whales back here again. And thanks to like the Squamish stream keepers and a bunch of other groups um, putting back and making habitat on wharfs and everything from Christmas trees to Squamish and then Falls Creek, bringing the herring back and places for the herring to lay eggs. Um, the anchovies are coming back. Uh, the last five years, there's been so many sightings of orcas. Uh, mainly the transient bigs and uh, we even got a humpback there about two months ago. 
uh, right off New Brighton Park pretty well, which is really amazing. So you bring the salmon back, you bring the herring back first and foremost, and uh, all the wildlife comes back. All the cetaceans come back, the whales come back. Um, we got a lot of traffic obviously in there. There's quite a bit of traffic even out here, but uh, boat traffic, but Vancouver, uh, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, how much boat traffic that, uh, it's a big part of the economy. Um, Trans Mountain will add, uh, Trans Mountain Corporation will add uh, 800 trips a year. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that 400 coming in, 400 going out with the Trans Mountain expansion. Uh, I've been on the uh, Ocean Protection Plan Committee for the last two years. Uh, Justin Trudeau started that up with the $1.5 billion investment in the Ocean Protection Plan. Um, uh, there's been some very good work there, a lot of really good people on there. I, I'm actually very surprised and shocked how open the government was uh, when the new government, liberal government came in um, and how actually open these meetings were. But one of the things that hit me uh, last year, we had uh, the marine mammal uh, sonar crew came in that specifically look at the southern resident uh, uh, orcas all along the coast here. And they've been installing uh, the hydrophones, underwater hydrophones all up and down the route that uh, Trans Mountain's gonna take the, uh, the bitumen out. And uh, one of the big issues that we're having um, is uh well they somehow pulled the money for uh the sonar crew uh but a lot of the right people got the sonar crew money back which is good with the ocean protection plan so they've hired an additional uh hydra uh, technician which is really good so we have two full-time um federal employees uh tracking the whales at all times here there's many other groups that track uh all the whales, all the cetaceans. Um, but what shocked me at that meeting last winter was all day long for literally from eight in the morning till about four in the afternoon, uh, we had a live view feed um, and we could hear uh, the orcas and all the whales go by uh, in the winter last year off of uh, Victoria Saanich and the peninsula. And you would not believe how loud those ships are. And all the ships, everything from whale watching boats to, but mainly the big ones, and uh, and the whales just they just take off. That was one of the that's what we all learned that day. The whales when they're feeding with their echolocation, uh, when the ships come by and they come by, literally every ten minutes, um, the whales really had nowhere to go, and uh, you know they'll go down. Uh, they're taking off a lot longer now. The southern residents. Uh, the northern resident population is doing quite well. The numbers are up near 300, I think they were. But we really only have 72 of the southern resident orcas. Uh, the Chinook salmon, as you know, is uh, almost been decimated on the coast here. Um, the sports fishery has been, uh, um, it's been a, you know, a boom for this economy here. But unfortunately, the Chinook salmon have, it's, it's, it, we're in really bad shape there. And uh, so hopefully these new uh, DFOs, new, I don't have 100% faith in them to tell you the truth, but uh, hopefully these new uh, restrictions um, and uh, really restricted fishing um, uh, times and openings uh, will help out our Southern residents. Um, I just read something in the uh, newspaper the other day that we get below 70 or 65 for the Southern residents, the gene pool, they really just, there's after that the gene pool so small and limited that uh, it's just a matter of time before we lose them. Um, I'd like to read a lot more about that, but uh, to see them out here with the residents and the, sorry the bigs and the transients is is a gift that I can't even tell people. Uh, I don't recommend people. Uh, this is quite controversial, but I, I really don't recommend people to go on whale watching trips. Um, some of them do a very good job. Um, uh, but I've seen it here. I've seen it down in Seattle. Or sorry, uh, I've seen it uh, out in Victoria, and I've literally seen you know 30 or 40 boats um, in behind a pod of three or four orcas. And uh, you can imagine all those boats. And it doesn't matter if you're 100 meters, 200 meters, 400 meters exclusion zone. 
uh, all those props going on and off. Uh, it's, it's just not healthy for our southern residents. And uh, we're literally loving these beautiful animals to death. Um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, that's very controversial. Um, I, I, I can see in the future that there will be no whale watching boats. There is absolutely enough places on this uh, coast uh, in and out of Victoria that you can actually watch uh, whales uh, from the land, some really good places, and uh, can watch them from the land safely. Um, that goes for kayakers too, like myself. Uh, for the first time, I, like I do spend a lot of time out in the water. Uh, first time last year, I got caught in a pod of dolphins, and uh, I always stay away from the dolphins. I get pictures. I got a big camera, I can take them from a long ways away. And uh, just about four months ago, right in Half Moon Bay, I got uh, about 30, 40 dolphins around me. It's an absolute gift. I just put my paddle down, he stopped, and then uh, they came in, fed all around me, and uh, I took pictures, and I moved on. You just always got to get out of their way when they're feeding. Even in a kayak, you don't want to be anywhere near them when they're feeding. And uh, it's just respect. It's just absolute respect. Uh, I think most people know that. A lot of people don't. They think they can even get in there with their kayaks. Uh, these dolphins came back three times around me. So I paddled out of the way, and they came back again, and then finally they took off. But it was my job, and I said it on camera during filming, it's my job to get the heck out of there, to get away from their feeding zone, let those beautiful dolphins uh, feed on the herring and the anchovies and uh, the young salmon. But uh, yeah, to have this out here is people from all around the world want to come here, and they are here. They're actually, even right now, there's... I've seen a few tours here, and uh, even during times of COVID, uh, they love this place. We love it too, but we have to protect the sacred salmon. Um, I say that all the time, sacred salmon, and it, uh, uh, it, it literally sacred to a lot of us. Uh, I call it the lifeblood of the coast, uh, the salmon. But uh, we've seen what happened with the cod fishery back east, with uh, just fished it out, just really, really bad news. Um, we are having some serious, serious issues with the farm salmon, not too far from here. I can almost see one of the ones here. Um, but with a lot of the, a lot of the indigenous first coast Salish nations are actually removing them from uh, their territories. Um, I can't see these, uh, um, and they're just the way it's going, which is really positive shift. I, I literally can't see more than five, six years of uh, more farm salmon up here. I think they'll all be gone within, you know, five, seven, eight years, which is good. The provincial government is doing an okay job at that. A lot of people would argue with me on that one, but uh, uh, DFO, I don't know what's going on there with them and with these. Uh, it's proven uh, uh, Alexander Morton's doing some amazing work. She's won all of her court cases to. You know, the sea lice is serious, serious, uh, and it is not helping whatsoever our wall stocks, that's for sure. But uh, I think we'll hear a lot more about that. Uh, we are hearing a lot more about that right now, but I think there's a very positive shift there. Um, we won't see much of that. Uh, we're starting to see more land-based uh, fish farming, and uh, that creates some problems too, but I think we'll see a little bit more of that. But uh, yeah, the future there for, I don't know. It's a tough one for farm salmon, and uh, and it's a tough one on both sides of that uh, deal. But they've had some incredibly serious toxic um, spills coming out of these, uh, and not just spills. You know, we've seen all the horrific videos lately. But uh, I try to keep focused on just my work. Um, I keep it uh, positive. Um, try to just protect and help anybody throughout the province get kids into the creeks. It's always boots in the creeks, uh, very carefully if they are in the creeks. <laughs> a lot of people don't know, but when we do fish counts and stuff, uh, uh, we literally, a lot of, we're very careful if we walk in the creeks. Uh, we literally walk in the same boot prints that we did in previous years. Um, quite often we'll never get in a creek uh, when we do a fish count or have to, you know, only when we have to, you know, clear a blockage or pull some invasive species or something like that. Uh, just checking the time on here, sorry, 7.53. Um, we do a lot of, uh, um, in Burnaby too, um, I 
education programs, which is really good. And I know the uh, your group does that. Almost everybody does it. Uh, I've started to work with the universities uh, the last couple of years. Uh, UBC SAP I've been working with and doing tours up there uh, for quite a while. But getting people interested in these local salmon creeks and uh, um, and if you can do like arts we do the arts with these things we can do our first nations uh sorry i still say first nations but indigenous and coast salish artwork uh, a lot of people don't realize how big it is with uh, the salmon and the wildlife and uh, that seems to be an incredible way to touch people to protect these creeks of the salmon and uh, on the whales and cetaceans uh, you, see, you see it right here we can see this beautiful piece of work here these carvings down here all up and down the coast um, but it's an amazing way to touch people is with artwork so quite often we'll get kids to uh i come out and do a lot of eagle tours uh and it's hand in hand we found these two i'm not sure if you can see these uh Lori, we found these just down the road here we went for a walk last week and found these beautiful eagle feathers um but to get the kids connected, not just the kids, but sometimes I have to go in and we'll go in with a couple of people and teach a little community about how important that creek is, how important it is to use, uh, you know, safe, um, you know, when you're cleaning, changing your oil uh, or washing your car in the creek, uh, near the creek. And uh, so we'll go in and teach like large complexes and uh, just an awareness, awareness, which is really cool. And that's really helped out. Uh, we found out over the last 15 or so years, a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of these fish kills were just accidents, people not knowing, and uh, just ignorance. Like you know, they had no idea, and uh, a lot of them had no idea that there was fish in the creek, and in the middle of the city. So signage is a big problem. A lot of the municip municipalities, Burnaby, was never big on putting signs up, and uh, I asked, I asked quite a few years ago, I asked the city of Burnaby. Or some more salmon signs in uh, Deer Lake Brook and a couple of the streams in Silver Creek. And I just went up and made them. <laughs> it took three years and, and didn't get anywhere. I just painted some myself. They're still up there <laughs> doing their job. And uh, But, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes working in, uh, uh, with some of the organizations and uh, cities. But most of them now are very good. And we've got great um, relations with them. And uh, with the, I just took the mayor of Burnaby out a couple months ago. Actually, he took me out, but I took him for a tour of Burnaby Mountain, uh, showed him a sacred rock that we're protecting. Um, the municipal crew came out. I'm working with the Burnaby Village Museum in the city of Burnaby, and, uh, uh, which is really, really neat. But uh, and I'll tell you, Mayor Mike Hurley was very interested. He's in very good shape, that guy too, I gotta tell you. He's in really good shape. Uh, me and him left the young ones in the dust. And I took him for two hours and 15 minutes straight up almost to the top of the mountain. And But it was all about protecting those two or three creeks up there and the development issues. Um, it was, it's a really neat. Uh, a lot of people don't realize the history of the Brunette watershed. Um, in the old days, and I'm talking not too long ago, um, there was no fish in the Brunette whole watershed, Burnaby Lake, all the way up Still Creek, all the way up to Renfrew Creek in East, uh, East Vancouver. There's no fish for about 80 years, no salmon in that creek whatsoever. It's an incredibly healthy salmon creek before then, but in the early 1900s, down in Westminster, they had factories and they had all sorts of really bad stuff. They had, was dammed up, it was absolutely toxic. Uh, uh, nobody had fish, actually. A lot of that, even back in the early 1900s, um, a lot of the KK, Lewis Minister, we call them KK Nation, um, and Muskman would come up, they would not fish anywhere below the Brunette River, so badly polluted. But a guy named uh, uh, Elmer, in uh, 1969, he started uh, with the Fish and Wildlife, uh, Sapperton Fish and Wildlife Club, and he decided that he's going to clean it up, and him and his crew started cleaning the Brunette River up in 1969. I didn't get involved till many, many years later, and a whole bunch of people got involved. Uh, municipalities, uh, Burnaby, newest minister, everybody got involved. The province got involved. And literally only about the last 14 or 15 years did we get fish up there. We removed a couple of dams, built a couple of fish ladders on Stony Creek, and uh, cleaned it up. But for 
literally it was a 30 something year cleanup and uh, he's a mentor of mine he's an amazing guy he comes to the great salmon send off every year and uh, he, it's really cool he's, he's like a rock star there too and he's a very neat guy and uh, really love that man uh, 30 years cleanup they had no fish in there they kept trying i was just hats off to them but uh, that's the kind of things and uh, creek initiatives that can be done uh, takes a lot of people uh, they had a lot of Boy Scouts and Young and Girl Scouts and uh, environmental groups in there. I understand there was over 100 groups involved in that cleanup. And, uh, but we finally have this most amazing watershed uh, that uh, we have to protect. It's, it's critical that we protect that. Uh, and that brings all the bears back from Burnaby Mountain. Uh, down, they love, the, they, they love that creek, I tell you, during the return time. Um, we got cougars, we got bobcats. Um, bobcats are coming back, uh, but it's really cool to see in that inlet that we got the southern resident orcas, mainly the uh, the transient big sorry coming in there, but humpbacks. So we protect it, you build it, they'll they'll come back for sure. Um, my great grandfather um, times two, uh, Chief Joe Capilano, and the first Capilano. I'm going to give everybody a little bit of homework here, but it's, this is okay. I know the time's getting short. But uh, Chief Joe Capilano and the first Capilano were quite the hunter and fisherman. And there's a legend in Deer Lake. And I didn't know how to do this over, it's quite a long legend, uh, but it only takes you four or five minutes to read. When I tell you, it would be like 20 minutes. So I won't do it here. But you have a little homework, and, you, and it's a really easy four or five minute read. And it's called The Legend of Deer Lake. Uh, I know it as the Great Elk Spear Legend. And uh, you can read it in Pauline Johnson's The Legends of Vancouver. You can read it online or buy the book. You can read it online, The Legend of Deer Lake. And you read that, and that'll tell you a little bit of history about the hunting and fishing that happened at Deer Lake. It'll tell you about the beavers in Deer Lake and the exodus of beavers and the great fires back in the day, great wildfires. But when I do my tours, I, t I do tell, now I hand out the legend everybody read before they do it but it's a very interesting legend and it's quite cool that you can actually walk in the place uh, around Deer Lake in Beaver Creek specifically you can walk right across that and, and uh, you read that legend and it'll absolutely blow you away and that's with the first chief Joe Capilano actually but uh, it's a very cool legend um, in that book too the legends of Vancouver is kind of a weird name but Pauline Johnson grandfather told Pauline Johnson, amazing writer, um, back in the early 1900s, uh, 1910, 1911, whenever that was, uh, all these legends, uh, Squamish Nation legends, another cool one that hit me really hard, uh, and then I go there quite a bit, but uh, it's actually just a ways from Wreck Beach, but, uh, um, and it's uh, called Point Grey, and it's amazing, kind of the long lost art of, uh, long lost, not an art, but uh, uh, celebration and uh, ceremony uh, is cold water swimming. And that's in the Point Grey legend. And then uh, there's the Skulsh, the Transformer, uh, which is Siwash Rock. I understand we'll need a new name for that pretty soon. But there's also, my great grandpa was one of the first ones uh, to climb up uh, the Sisters. Some people know it as the Lions, but the Sisters. But that book is absolutely amazing. And just read a couple of those legends at a time. You can read it online, but uh, that Point Grey one is really cool. Siwash Rock one is really cool. Skulls to the Transformer. But specifically that Deer Lake legend. And it'll teach you some stuff about cedar. It'll teach you some stuff about fishing. About uh, how many people went, uh, how many of the, literally he was, grandfathers were great fishermen and hunters. But a lot of people didn't realize that. And my, how many hands made, this is cedar that my uh, niece Nicole did. And she's been teaching at Emily Carr and everywhere. I'm doing a bunch of work with her. But how many hands went in from the village at that time in uh, Squamish Nation to make that great elk spear that passed through many generations? And then literally the cedar rope on the end of it to catch seals and stuff like that. It wasn't just one hunter, my great grandfather. Uh, it took a lot of people and a lot of the ladies to weave that cedar rope and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, your homework, if that's okay, I'd like to thank everybody. And uh, I think we're time wise is yeah, 8.03. I think we got a little, uh, do we got a little bit more time for?
Hey, John, can you show us some of your photos? Can you? Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> there we go. This is going to be interesting. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, everybody. We're. Yeah, and we definitely have some time for questions. So if anyone wants to, to pop them in the chat box there, or I think now it's fine if you want to unmute yourself and, uh, and just ask it as well. I think that's great. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. How are we gonna do it though? Yeah, we. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Hey, John, are you able to scroll through some of your photos yeah. while we're yeah. waiting for questions? I'm, gonna, I'm trying right now. Yeah. If you can figure it out. <laughs> Might have to do like the new screen share. Or yeah, we'll do a couple. <laughs> here. Oh, you're getting everything there, aren't you? Yeah, we're so lucky with Burnaby that we have such an amazing bounty of uh, of wildlife, um, of literally everything we have. Uh, um, like I said, I got pictures of bear. We, got, we see everything there. We got Glenn and I, who's online here. We got pictures of beavers and muskrats and. Uh, we, we see everything. The eagles, uh, I'm doing a lot of work with. I'm doing a, um, a lot of work on Burnaby Mountain and uh, with the eagles. I've been monitoring them for 25 years, but a lot of people don't realize how many eagles that we have in Burnaby and that fly over Burnaby. And I do apologize here. This is, I said we had this working earlier very well, about an hour before. But I just can't seem to. There. Um, a lot of a lot of things we do in the whole brunette watershed is known for uh, uh, birding. A lot of people don't realize we're in, kind of on the we're on the flyway, and uh, it's absolutely. Um, anything come out there? No, not yet. Anything come out there, Carmen? Not yet. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just still seeing all of your photos. Yeah, okay. So, there seems to be something bizarre about the your share screen function. Yeah, or it just could be me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sarah Ross was asking, is stream keeping mostly about salmon or is it also important to work with streams that do not support salmon? Or yeah. would most streams have supported salmon at one time? They, yes, Definitely. Hi, Sarah. Good to good to have you aboard. It's amazing. I heard you had an amazing chat last uh, last month. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, most of the ones that are in town were uh, in all over the coast. It's not all about salmon, but there's some that you know trout and cutthroat trout, and a lot of places they're doing work to uh, you know um, not just salmon in the interior. There, you know, all sorts of different fish. Uh, uh, the sockeye up in sockeye salmon, the Okanagan Lake, Okanagan Nation has been doing some amazing work. They got fish coming 750 miles up from down the Columbia River and up in Okanagan Lake now. There's some stream stream keeping groups that are just Dolly Varden, cutthroat trout, uh, and some are just trying to protect creeks. A lot of them they don't really have any fish in them. Um, most of the coast, most almost all of the coast creeks that are fairly healthy have cutthroat trout in them. A lot of people don't realize this. Uh, cutthroat trout live in the creeks year round and uh, uh, live in the year round. They're quite small. Sometimes they'll get up to a little bit bigger, uh, you know, 16 inches or so. And, uh, but uh, yeah, most of all, but most of them were trying to protect the salmon and uh, trying to get them going. Oh, maybe we've got a picture there. Do we have a picture? No, not yet. <laughs> it's scrolling like it wants to. I'm going to. I do apologize. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, we had it. We had it earlier. But... Yeah, and I do apologize. Oh, there we go. There's okay. So, there. Well, that's just the one that kind of random came up. This is on Burnaby Lake. Uh, we have uh, we do a lot of beaver tours. A lot of people don't realize how many beavers we have in Burnaby Lake. They've just started to come back in uh, Deer Lake the last few years. And, but this is right on the bridge in Deer Lake Brook. 
you can actually see this at Deer Lake Brook. Uh, and there's approximately anywhere between 25 to 40 beaver in just Burnaby Lake. So if you ever want to see a really cool place to see beaver, you just go down every night. It doesn't matter what night it is. Go down about an hour before at sunset, head down to the Steel Creek, go across the bridge or along the trail beside the rugby field there, and you will see a lot of beavers and they're going up and they'll come right all the way up. They'll go all the way into uh, like uh, um, uh, West Burnaby. They'll go up towards Costco. And, uh, but yeah, you'll see uh, old and new on Burnaby Lake. And if you, anybody ever gets to kayak or canoe Burnaby Lake, it's absolutely amazing. And you'll see a whole bunch of these. This you can see right from the trail. Um, they're blocking. The city of Burnaby has a crew. Not a lot of people know about this, but they have actually a crew. Uh, three pretty tough guys and they go out every Thursday night, Friday morning with these crew to block, uh, unblock uh, uh, some of the beaver dams, you know, the ones, they leave the ones that are healthy and good for the ecosystems and stuff. But a lot of them, they have to go pull out because they'd be flooded in that, you know, down near eight rinks and stuff like that. And the Bill Copeland Center, but uh, let me give you another picture. Hang on a sec. But this right in Burnaby, we will see if we can get. Um, Sarah was also asking, do you have a formal education in science or ecology? No, I, I actually don't. And good question. But all of the stream keepers take uh, stream keeping programs. And oh, there we can see everybody's on. Hi, everybody. It's good to have you all here. Um, we have, uh, we take stream keeping um, and some really cool courses. And uh, quite often they're paid for by the stream keeping. Uh, they're usually $50 and they're like a two day deal. And we're right in the creeks. And uh, we'll do it wherever. Um, Pacific Salmon Foundation and uh, um, has these workshops, two-day workshops, and they're they're pretty they're pretty thorough workshops. But you get to meet a lot of people, and uh, they're doing a little bit less now because of the COVID. Uh, they're still doing the training, but it's a two-day workshop. It's amazing what you learn. It's a, a, from bug counts to uh, um, invasive species, but they literally you have to do your homework, and that night you have to do your homework for the two-day courses, but uh, no, I don't have, um, I always say that uh, you gotta have boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent a lot of time the last five years uh, fighting some big battles in creeks. And uh, I spent too much time in front of the computer and that makes me physically, makes me kind of grumpy, to tell you the truth. I'd much rather be out walking with my good buddy Glenn here and anybody in my tours and actually taking photos and stuff, but we learn. I, I sat on top of Burnaby Mountain for many years. I had a bad back, and I, but the healing part of it was climbing to the top of Burnaby Mountain every day and sitting up there. And uh, literally, I couldn't work for quite a long time. But I'd watch those eagles, and I get and what you learn is amazing. Right here, I can uh, just watch the eagles every day. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that eagles uh, they love fish, but I tell you, in town and here, you don't want to know how many ducks they eat. They eat a lot of duck eagles, and uh, they are experts at it. I got a lot of recent pictures. I wish I could get these up. I do apologize. I just can't seem to get this going. Um, but yeah, we see a lot of stuff uh, when you're up there, and you're out there for a long, long time. People don't quite really realize how much time I spent in the creeks. And uh, we got some beautiful places on Burnaby Mountain. You know, me and my buds would just sometimes sit in an old cedar log right beside the creek, and you can see the you know salmon come up or uh, cutthroat trout or uh, you know and quite often you don't see any up there because uh, they're quite a bit lower but uh, it's an amazing place to learn I tell you to boots in the field for sure mm -hmm. get these here. Hang on a sec. um Chani Yi Li has asked um, if we can take part in the stream keeping work and also that you mentioned about a sacred walk and is it open to the public yeah we do uh and so I always say, and if you need any help, if you have any creeks around you, I can help you uh, with the stream keeping groups uh, and are in really cool environmental groups. Um, we've got the Burnaby Lakes Parks Association, which I work very closely with and help them out. Uh, and we help each other out quite a bit. An amazing group. And they've actually been able to, uh, people of all ages, which is really cool. And we have a lot of the kids and students that actually do a lot of their work with the stream keeping. So, we're always looking for volunteers. 
always looking for volunteers and we can wherever you want to help out we can we'll find a group there for you for sure and uh but yeah these sacred rock yeah we, we do a lot of them and uh they're really cool um uh, you learn a lot we do them Burnaby Mountain's got a lot of people don't realize it's got a beautiful sacred rock that we are protecting with the province now and the city of Burnaby's helping me out um, and it's one that uh not a lot of people know about. Usually, a lot of First Nations don't share these, um, some of these uh, sacred places and transformer rocks at all. But this one needed to be protected. Uh, had to talk to the elders uh, from a couple different nations to actually make sure that we had to protect this rock and that we had to tell people about it. And uh, so, yeah, the best part about that was for many, many years, I'd only brought in you know 12 or 14 people into it. But now I actually bring people, and it's it's quite something here. Let me see if I have a picture here. We'll see. But uh, yeah, we always do it. Uh, here's one right here. Let me see if I can get if I can get this up. It looks like this sharing mm -hmm. might be closed, but yeah, if you get it up and then hit share screen, and we'll see if we can yeah. see it. Let's see if I can get this. Yeah, this part is uh, this part's a little tricky. Here we go. And the good mayor is in this photo. Not a great picture of it, but uh, anything there? No. No. Try. Hit, did you yeah. hit share screen? That little yeah. green button at the bottom. Yeah. It seems to be activated. Yeah. It's just playing. It's playing nasty tricks on me. It's. It's. It's not. I think it's just me, but it's okay. I, yeah. It's. I'm sorry. It's just not. It says now it's turned off. I do apologize, but yeah, we're uh, yeah we do all sorts of tours and uh, like I said, lots of stream keeping environmental groups all over Vancouver, and then I can help anybody out uh, get in touch with these pretty cool people. And I was like for the kids, but we have people of all ages. We get yeah. kids that are six, eight years old, and uh, and then we get them down as low as uh, or up as high. We got 80, 85 year olds helping out, and uh, and older actually. So it's really quite really quite cool. Can I ask a question of who's the we? Are you in a particular group or are you just Yeah, we do. Well, quite often I work a lot of the tours by myself, but now uh -huh. I'm, we're going to be doing some tours with, uh, which is really cool. I do a lot of tours with uh, universities, SFU. Um, we'll be doing uh, Emily Carr, done, started working with, but the city of Burnaby, uh, newest minister and then but we'll see a lot more in Burnaby now with the city of Burnaby and I started to work with uh, the, just this last year with the uh, and will be on the indigenous committee for uh, the Burnaby Village Museum and a big part of that will be doing tours that's, that's what I really enjoy doing tours eh? so mm -hmm. and they're really good. yeah they're really cool but yeah a lot of most of for the most part I've been doing them by myself for years and I sorry I lost everybody here I can just bury them. There we go. I do apologize. Okay. Technical issues up here. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if you have any other questions, let me know. And uh, Well, I was wondering if you have a website where we could look at your photos since we didn't get to see them today. It would, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the best place to, you know, the, yeah, you may, you may hit the dark zone there, but the best place, I do have a website. It's not that good, uh, is Facebook or Instagram. And, oh, yeah. On Instagram, I have more of my adventure stuff, but Facebook, I have, and you'll be lost. There's so many photos in there, but Facebook, John Prizo, and uh, there's a lot of stream keeping photos, a lot of eagle shots there, and wildlife shots, a lot of fun shots too. And Instagram, I don't have so many there, but there is some on Instagram, but Facebook, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, my, my, unfortunately, my uh, uh, website's not so good, it needs to be updated. Yeah, I see John's uh, photos on Facebook, and they're amazing. Every day, more amazing photos. <laughs> and some people just block me, but that's okay. They're all good. Yeah, <laughs> but I do try to get a lot, and we do. A, I still do a lot in the media, a lot yeah. in the media, and uh, 
fun. My good buddy Glenn here has been doing a lot in the media too in the last couple of years, and uh, and we really enjoy getting our wildlife shots in particular with the local media, which is really neat. When I first got up here two months ago, um, we had a really rare funnel cloud, a double funnel cloud off of here, and it was quite something. And then uh, I left it for a week, and I thought, you know what, that's really rare. I only see these every 10 years. I've only seen it once before, actually, and uh, so we got that in Vancouver is awesome. And but, but Glenn and I here get a lot of shots in the local media, which is good. Eagles, we do a lot of the work with the. Uh, we get a lot of eagle shots. Uh, uh, we were there when the nest blew down at Burnaby Lake. Uh, we were there when they built the new nest, um, uh, which is really cool. So. Yeah, it's been really fun. Uh, I got an eagle workshop coming up next week, which is I'm really looking forward to too. And just specifically uh, zooming in there, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. But the eagles around Burnaby are just amazing. They're just all over Vancouver, and a lot of people don't see them, but uh, they're they're everywhere. And uh, they come here, and then they fly away, and they go up to the North Pole, or uh, you know May, June, May. But uh, there's a lot in this area. I tell you, whole mm -hmm. every day. Yeah, it's been really, it's been a lot of fun, and Burnaby is a really good place to for a wildlife photographer. I can assure all. And, uh, now that we have, uh, you can never get out, um, you know, in the kayaks, you know, um, you go up at Kate's Park anywhere. You get out in the inlet and get to see that stuff. You get up at Deep Cove and get out in the kayaks up there. It's just absolutely stunning. It's just beautiful, and and we've had the uh, transient bigs up there three or four times in the last three months. Lots of good photos and videos. Uh, I was on assignment uh, for uh, the critical infrastructure when the transients came in, and uh, they came into uh, they came up into the arm past Kate's Park, way of which and went up all past Deep Cove, and so I booted it downtown. I headed downtown, went straight to Stanley Park. I was taking pictures of tankers coming in, and uh, for the media. And there was nobody downtown there because it was the early days of COVID. So I was, uh, it was an essential service. And uh, I went, ran all the way over to, because uh, I didn't want to take a bus or anything. I ran all the way over to uh, underneath the Lionsgate Bridge. And I thought, I'm just going to wait for the whales to come back. Wait for these, uh, and I waited all day, waited all afternoon. It was raining. I was good. I had food. I had water. I was well dressed. There was hardly nobody on the seawall. It was getting dark. Oh, wow. Hey, these whales are going to come right underneath the Lionsgate Bridge. I'm, I got to get amazing shots of them. It's getting dark. It was the only time they'd ever stayed overnight because they usually go in for two, three hours at the most and they come right out. And I was smart. I thought I was smart. No, it got dark. I was still out there. And then they didn't actually, uh, they stayed in and around uh, Barnett Beach and they came back the next day in the morning. I was sleeping at the time. But it didn't work out. But the next time it'll work out for me. And it was so much so that I enjoyed myself out there so much, even though I didn't get the shots, I wrote an orca song while I was out there. And that was, out, I don't know, eight, nine hours, whatever it was. And I actually wrote an orca song. And uh, I will get a little bit of help with that orca song. And uh, I got the drums all figured out. Uh, and a lot of fun. I drummed here a, a while ago, and my niece, Nicole Kaisel, she's an absolutely amazing drummer and singer. She's been teaching us all, and uh, I was out with uh, Lori and my good friend. We were in this big, huge rowboat, beautiful rowboat here already about a month ago, and I was so blown away by their rowing that uh, I actually sang and drummed the Woman's Warrior song, and uh, everybody in the cove could hear me. I don't know if you can see. I don't know if anybody can see that, but everybody in Secret Cove, and it's it all came out. It was kind of nice. And uh, but I think that's what the seal the deal with my girlfriend. She liked my fun <laughs> <and> singing. <laughs> but it's a beautiful place up here and uh, absolutely stunning to, to be able to paddle on these waters. Uh, I work pretty well out every day. I've been pretty busy with other work, but uh, mm -hmm. you have to work. We go out like every night on a stand up paddle board or kayak. And, uh, it's a beautiful place. But seals come fish right down here every morning, uh, every, day, every day, all day long. Mm -hmm. But yeah, again, it's our job to protect. Our mm -hmm. job to protect these beautiful areas, British Columbia and all these lands here are, I've been lucky enough to travel a lot of places in the world, a lot of places. And we got some amazing places all around the world. But uh, diving, I remember diving here when I took my open water diving 
here, but to see this every day and then be in anywhere in the lower mainland in a half an hour, 40 minutes, I can get out in the middle of nowhere and I can hike to places like Burnaby Mountain. I can hike to my secret spots on Mount Seymour. I can go down to the water and it, there's hardly nobody there. And during times of COVID, every little place has been full, but I can still get my hideaways. I can still go into the creeks on Burnaby Mountain where there's nobody there. And, uh, and I absolutely love that. It's absolutely a gift uh, to grow up in Burnaby and literally the brunette watershed. Like I said, Glenn and I, we, two or three times a week, we're down at Deer Lake, Burnaby Lake. Uh, We'll go everywhere. We'll go down the cranberry fields, and uh, we've got access to the cranberry fields. Uh, with the Mayf family give us access for about 10 years now, and you would not believe how many eagles, hawks, sandhill cranes are down there. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty lucky to have all that green space in Burnaby. And uh, it's a pretty amazing place to grow up and actually do my work for the most part. Hey, John. Would you be okay if we shared your email so if people wanted to go on one of your tours? Yeah, for sure, um, yeah. Then, then yeah. they could ask you. And maybe when COVID settles down a little bit, Still yeah. Moon could have you lead a tour for us. That would be great. I'd, I'd be honored. That'd be awesome. Yeah, great. yeah for sure. Yeah, because I, I just put your email in the, in the chat. So if people want to contact you directly about tours or things you're doing they, they could ask they could ask you that yeah, super we'll we'll yeah. do a we'll do a cool tour and it'll be really nice and be awesome to have and it's be good to get back into the tours uh, i had nine tour like within two weeks everything got canceled and i was like oh wow good thing my work is diversified and but it's one of the things i really miss is taking the kids out uh, yeah. one of my main goals now is taking out for the last five years is taking the young uh uh, indigenous kids from all around the world, by the way. Um, I started with the NWSS and uh, a good buddy of mine, Daryl Nakashima, a Burnaby boy, and a good crew there. All right, um, the I Aboriginal can... program there. So I introduce them to the universities in grade 11 and 12, the young students. And then I work with uh, Gary George, um, and he's up at SFU at the um, Aboriginal People's uh, Office up there. So we introduce, and that's been my main focus now, is to introduce these uh, grade 11s and 12s to the support that they have in university for post-secondary, mm -hmm. uh, which is really cool. So we do a lot of that with NWSS. And NWSS, like I grew up right down the road. I graduated from uh, Burnaby South, but a lot of my friends and family, uh, yeah, Burnaby South, and Rebels, and... Uh, <laughs> Rebel for life, some may call me. Um, but we do, yeah, so that's my big passion now is actually getting these kids into, uh, before they even graduate, they actually are, have met Gary George, literally we go for tours there and he'll, they'll give us a welcome song. They sing and drum for us and all the students have to tell their stories and uh, go around the table and uh, it's really a cool project and uh, it's not a project actually, it's a passion of mine. But it's really cool. And hats off to Gary George and SFU and uh, Ron Clark up there. Uh, SFU has been amazing to work with too. And, uh, and it's just passionate people doing, sharing their passions. But education is key for, you know, as we know, for Indigenous folks. And uh, I was very lucky to grow up in a household that um, education was first and foremost what that's what we had to do. We couldn't ski race, we couldn't do anything, we had to do our homework first. And uh, I remember missing so much high school, me and my brother, he, when he was in grade nine, 10, we were ski racing. And mom and dad, very humble people, a nurse and a barber. And uh, they just says, you mess around, you miss any more school, you can miss it for ski racing, but you gotta do your homework. And, uh, and that was always it. They were no messing around there. You gotta pay first, then you play. So I was very lucky to grow up in the mountains all four seasons. Quite often, people in my childhood, holy cow, I did a lot of rock climbing in my childhood. Carmen and my friends have seen a lot of that. I still rock climb. I do a lot of rock climbing up here. Yeah, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, but I thank my parents. My dad's Austrian, so in the mountains, that was it. But I think a lot of people wanted to phone child services on us when we were kids. They've seen some of our pictures. <laughs> I, post, I post them quite, well, quite once in a while, but it was a honored to be uh my parents are just amazing people and my mom
mom specifically has shared her wisdom and still teaching at Langier, 85 years old, uh, still sharing her wisdom, therapeutic touch. Just bought a brand new car last year at 85 years old. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, she's really cool, and a really neat lady. So I like to share that with our, you know, our kids and stuff. So it's pretty cool. But, yeah, I'd like to again thank everybody for yeah spending your beautiful summer night. We finally got a nice summer. Oh. Oh, so nice. So nice here. Look, you guys got some pretty cool. Look at this, eh? Yeah, well, thank you so much, John. Yeah, I decided to sit outside in my yard so I could enjoy the summer evening yeah. as well as your talk. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, thank you very much. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I saw you picking raspberries and eating them too. Weren't you? Nice. <laughs> Yes, I was. I was caught out. <laughs> I think the neighbor here's got a blender going with raspberries and Yeah, I've got the full I've got a full thing of raspberries. I picked them during the talk. <laughs> nice. well, I gotta I gotta show you something here. If I can reach this cord here, right below us we have, which is really cool. My girlfriend Lori, I'm not sure if you can see that, but there's blackberries, which I'm gonna attack tomorrow. I don't know if you can see them right down there. And then, but the salal berries are, they're ready. And we've got huckleberries down here, right here in our backyard. It's amazing. So, and some of those will be going into some, uh, and already have been going into some pretty cool tinctures, special tinctures. They may have gin in them or vodka, but they're special <laughs> tinctures. No, don't tell anybody that. But I, think I had the blackberries uh, this afternoon when I got home from work. And uh, made a little blackberry, uh, I think it's called blackberry soup or rhubarb soup, but uh, blackberries and put them on top of ice cream when I got home from work. <laughs> Life is good. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, lots of, yeah, but we pick them right here, which is really cool. So it's good. But Carmen, thank you. Emma, thank you. And uh, everybody from your amazing uh, society, you guys have been doing such good work. And I like how you've connected the arts with, you know, really protecting the land and stream keeping, which is, that's a, that's brilliant. And how many years is that now? Um, this will be our 18th moon festival. So it's been like 18 years that we've been highlighting Still Creek via the moon festival and then all the stewardship that's, activities as well. Yeah. That's absolutely amazing. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's off. And that, that, uh, I know it's not easy to run a society or a group or environmental group. And uh, I think that's why for so many years I did it by myself. And uh, so long ago, wow, hey, pain in the ass by myself sometimes. Right? But then, but really good. Last four or five years, we've got a lot of help. Uh, uh, the Watch House in Burnaby Mountain, Slave Tooth Nation, Squamish Nation, and the community came together. Mm -hmm. uh, literally the Forest Grove community, all my neighbors came together the last four or five years and uh, knew what we had with these creeks and a lot of the development issues and, uh, and uh, been a big one with Trans Mountain, I can assure you that. Um, but we've had, uh, it's been really cool to see them and, and the young kids come out and help and it's been amazing. You know, we had, we've had some pretty big, uh, Mass gathering, there's 7,500 people here two years ago on Burnaby, on Burnaby Mountain. And uh, First Nations from literally across Canada came to that one. And uh, that's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, it's good to have so much help now. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's really good because I can tell you those early years were, they've run pretty ragged, but now there's lots of help. And everybody, it's, I'm forever grateful. You know, for all the cool people that helped us save our salmon creeks, and not just our salmon creeks, just wetlands, everything. You know, we need it. We absolutely need it. Uh, we've got sandhill cranes all over Burnaby, and uh, Glenn and I have found uh, uh, we have found a colt this year, but unfortunately, it, it didn't make it. Uh, we found some amazing stuff in Burnaby that we find literally every year, like all the time. We find these really cool wildlife finds that we get. Oh, yeah, we had uh, Trevor the Mandarin Duck. We uh, <laughs> ran out him last year. And that, so I, Glenn took this amazing shot. And we had about 45 seconds. And I, and I yelled, it's the Peking Duck, it's the Peking Duck. I'm trying to be really quiet because, you know, we're the only ones down at Deer Lake there. And it hadn't been around for quite a few months. So I'm sorry, the Mandarin Duck. 
shoot, shoot, so we had about 45 seconds. And we both got some incredible shots. I looked at Glenn's shot, and I said, holy cow. Let's send that into the room, you know. He goes, maybe. I said, no, no, send that into the room, you know. It's going to go crazy. He goes, really? And I said, yes, it's going to go crazy. He sent it into the room, now. He did 10 interviews. I was with him, three or four of them, in the following two weeks. We had like 50, 60 photographers there every day. That that duck, it's a nasty duck too, by the way. It's a very aggressive duck. But then I had to... I did another one. It was about three months later. Found the duck again by myself on Burnaby Lake, and uh, people love that duck. Right at the end. And I just tell different stories now how the duck got here. But it's, a, it's a very beautiful duck. It's an amazing, amazing duck. And, uh, yeah, I just press Mandarin duck and Glenn Govier's name, and you see those. It's absolutely amazing to see that duck. I've never seen such a beautiful duck. That's why they call it the most beautiful duck in the world. And we had a, quite a bit of time with it too over the quite a few months. It was really neat. We had one guy that, a good friend of ours now, that drove 14 hours from Cranbrook, got hold of Glenn, and he came down, calls himself a bird nerd. His name is uh, Jamie. He's a super guy, a skier and everything else too, and uh, mountain bike rider, which I really like about it. But he came down, met us at six in the morning, seven in the morning down at Deer Lake, and uh, we couldn't find the duck at first. And then I said to Jamie, I said, Jamie, sorry, you got off work in Cranbrook. You drove in the middle of winter, 14 hours to get down here to see this duck. And uh, he goes, yeah, I did. I got to get a picture of it. And I said, okay, let me go up the hill. So I went up the old hill towards the old Ocala, up the hill. I said, I'm going to find this duck. And then I did. We found it. I yelled down to Glenn. And we were on the cell phones. And this Jamie was running around Deer Lake with about 80 pounds of camera gear this big. But we got him his shot. And, and his local newspaper, they wrote an article on him. He's an amazing photographer, uh, mountain biker, and a skier. He's a backcountry skier like myself. So it's uh, he's a really cool. He meets some pretty cool people. But all that Trevor the Mandarin Duck and Glenn here named Trevor, and it just took off. And uh, it's a good story. But uh, the duck's still here. The duck is still around in Burnaby, anyways. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Well, much appreciated. Well, thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, John, for your information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. And then, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, she Sheila, sorry. <laughs> I recognize. I recognize you. Now. Oh, who I am? Yeah, it's been many, many years. Yes. Oh, sure has. It has John, been. John, please send us your email. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, John. Yeah. They're going to put it up here too, but it's John Prizel, J O H N P R E I S S L at hotmail.ca. Oh, I don't have the paper, so I'm going it's, to. Go uh, it's in the chat there, um, and uh, I can also send it out uh, in, oh, a, thank you. in a follow up email for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get you, yeah, I could help tour. We could. We've got so many cool places to see and we sometimes Ben and I'll go out and we'll have our tour group and uh, we'll go out to see eagles and hawks and we might see something totally different, and, but we always see something. And, uh, you know, the, the, the kind, kind of our standard joke that we go out looking for something and we always find something else that's cooler. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> good. yeah exactly. Yeah, it's good fun. Uh, cause they burn at the end and Vancouver everywhere. It's just, it's so beautiful. We're so lucky. Uh, I always tell everybody get out in the water, they'll paddle. If you can get out paddling, you know, anywhere, Kate's park. Uh, I've been trying to organize for our friends. Um, I'm lucky enough to go out with, uh, Takaya tours and to say with tooth nation and the big, the big, big, uh, the big canoes. And, uh, a couple times a year and, and you can rent them for like a song you can rent them and they'll take you out but uh so we'll get one going in the next month or so and uh do some a little bit more social distancing in the canoes now but it's it's a really cool way to kayak tours at to say with tooth nation and you always see an eagles and stuff in the inlet and, and you work you have to paddle everybody has to paddle i can assure you and it's uh, interesting to paddle those big ones uh I've been paddling my entire life. I've literally uh, everything you name it, surfer, surfing, I've done it all. But you paddle one of those big ones, and then uh, I tell you, it's a, it's a humbling experience. 
for sure. And, uh, but yeah, I always highly recommend anybody to Kai Tours, Pacific Nation, and get your friends out there, go on one of their tours out there. And uh, it's a really cool way to, well, just be on the water for one thing, but then, uh, you know, to hear people of the inlet. That's what, that's what they're called, and people of the inlet, and they share their traditions and cultures. And uh, we're seeing a lot more of that all up and down the coast, which is really cool. But uh, yeah, so get out in the water and you see totally different stuff. It's a gift. We have such a gift here um, and such a bounty here of wildlife and everything. But again, it's our job to protect it. A lot of people, a lot of really good people doing some amazing work here. So, yeah. Again, well, we should let everybody go and enjoy yeah. the rest of your night. And uh, again, thank you very much. Good night. Thank, and you. thank you, everybody at the society and Angus and everybody. Much appreciated. It's been an honor to have you guys spend your time. Yeah. Thanks so much, John. Thank you so much. Super. Thank you be with this view. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Not sure if I, if I can unplug <laughs> this. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's a secret cove right here, the open, Laskiti Island in behind, Texada Island here. Um, there's a little island called Jack Tomey Island. Uh, absolutely amazing. I'm not sure you can see that through either, but it's, uh, yeah. That's gorgeous. Lori's got this most amazing place and I just it's got every turkey vultures you, you name it eagles absolutely I'm gonna see if I get some pictures of the comet tonight <laughs> uh, I've been having so much fun I, I did get some pictures not bad pictures about a week ago not great pictures and then 